it's my great pleasure to welcome you all today to uh, our session in the, within the CLINAM with a topic from novel materials to improved therapies. Um, I don't want to take up too much time um, and therefore just uh, introduce our first speaker. The first speaker of our session today is uh, Professor Ulrich Schubert from Jena. I think everybody working in the field um, knows him very well, so I don't need to uh, introduce you extensively. The topic of his talk will be beyond polyester and nanoparticles for targeted anti-inflammatory strategies. Having said that, I would like uh, to invite you to share your screen and invite you all to this session. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to contribute if I get it running. So you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so I would like to use the time I have to discuss with you some aspects of research which we perform in our Sonderforschungsbereich in our Cultural Research Center Polytarget funded by the German Science Foundation. Here, our goal is to produce libraries of polymers, of block copolymers, hydrophobic, hydrophilic block copolymers, which we use to produce nanoparticle libraries uh, by, for example, nanoparticle formulation methods. We use colleagues in simulation to help us to select the right polymers for certain drugs, which we selected with our colleagues, for example, from pharmacy and from uh, biochemistry. Then we have a set of cells where we look at cell uptake, fate of the nanoparticles, release of the drugs. And with our colleagues from medicine, we selected certain organisms. And we do this in several iteration steps. Special in Jena is that we do a full characterization on all length scales. And at the very end of these projects, we would like to come up to structure property relationships to be able in the future to select directly the right suitable polymers for certain new drugs, for certain applications in targeted nano medicines. Now we work in particular in three areas that are new core materials, uh, degradable hydrophobic materials. We look at core materials based on cationic polymers for the complexation of genetic material and we work on new shell materials, stealth polymers beyond uh, polyethylene oxide, beyond PEG, which I will only very shortly target uh, and express today. Let me go into the details of our research. And this is beyond the typical degradable polymers, the polyesters, PLGA and PLA. Of course, they are widely used because they are biocompatible, they are FDA approved, so we find a lot of um, applications of these polymers. The pro of these polymers is they are sustainable. They can be really produced without using oil and gas. And of course, they are degradable. Why do we still do research in these areas? Well, there are several challenges. One challenge is, of course, to find and to improve the catalysts and to go to catalysts with very low toxicity. I will not talk about this today. The second is the crystallinity. The crystallinity of PLGA and PLA is there, is given. And that means also the release properties. And if you want to change them, change the release properties, we have to change something on the pumps. And then, of course, they have a certain hydrophobicity. And if we want to encapsulate different drugs, new drugs, they might be not, then PLGA and PLA might not be suitable. Therefore, we started to tackle these issues. Now, let's say we have a new potent truck we get from colleagues from pharmacy and we have our typical PLA or PLGA. So what we might face is low encapsulation efficiency. The polymer is just not really suitable for the new drug. One solution is that we match the hydrophobicity of the carrier to that of the drug with the help of simulation of modeling and go for new tailor-made copolymers. I will talk about that in a second. And that might end up with new polymers where we can load much more drugs into it. The second is the release. 
because of the crystallinity of the PLA, the PLJ, and the semi-crystallinity, they have a slow release. And for certain applications, we might need a very different release properties. Also, the acidic degradation products might harm our new super drug. Solutions for that could be new core polymers. I will talk about polyester amides and that we tailor the crystallinity of our polyesters. Let's start with one example. The typical polycarbolactone PCL is a semi-crystalline material. It has a certain hydrophobic hydrophilic balance based on the uh, ratio of polar groups and non-polar um, units. We can vary that monomer, we can go from the seven membered rings to the six membered rings. That means a method group is down the side to the delta capillotone. This is an amorphous system. And now we can go for random copolymers of these two of the semi crystalline known one and of the delta amorphous one. And by that, we can completely render the crystallinity down to very, very low uh, percentage. Uh, this we know from Bach studies, we know from DSC studies. And the TG is very low. And as I said, the hydrophobic hydrophilic balance of these polymers is not changed because the ratio of oxygen to carbon and hydrogen is the same. So this gives us a set of new degradable polymers with the same hydrophobic hydrophilic balance, but with totally tunable crystallinity with low TG values. We use this in a study with our colleague Oliver Wertz from Pharmacy to try to encapsulate efficiently a hydrophobic anti flammable drug. You see the structure here, uh, BRP187. We could produce nanoparticles by nanoprecipitation. You see here the images. Now, varying our, our uh, copolymers, we can really efficient, uh, very effectively uh, encapsulate that molecule and bring it to the site of action and really hinder, in this case, the 5LO production formation. And yes, it matters very much what our crystallinity is. And uh, of course, we still have this very low TG values. But this was one example in varying crystallinity. There are, of course, other possibilities. We can vary the kind of hydrophobic polymers from Polyester amides, well, I'll talk about this, where we have hydrogen bonds also between the truck and the carrier to poly polyphosphoresters, like the worm group uh, is working a lot in, to polyacetals and so on. We just recently summarized all these alternatives to polyesters in an extensive review. Now, polyester amides, classically, we can produce by step growth polymerization. And again, varying the units, we can adjust degradation behavior. And uh, this is the classical way we take uh, this oxazolines, we take dye acids at high temperature conditions, and we vary the dye acid and we keep the oxazoline part the same. And with that, and we like that very much, we can make systematic variations, a library of compounds. We learned that if we have unsubstituted poly, uh, poly uh, ester amides, they are crystalline, so we don't go with further with them, but we know exactly the structure, we know the, uh, the hydrogen bond formation and so on, and we know also how to encapsulate their drugs. And we can, if we have substituted polyester amides, they are amorphous and in a very interesting TG range. Now there, we investigate in more detail and we encapsulate another drug which is of interest in our CRC in Jena, Indomethacine, IMC, you see the structure here. And uh, not all polyester amides work, but the ones we selected, they have a very high loading capacity and they have also very good encapsulation efficiency. And we learned also how to um, correlate that to the formation of nanoparticles. Now, using DLC uh, and looking at the melting point depression, we could calculate the Froy Huggins parameters, and we know now which polymers are very compatible to this um, drug, which shows very strong hydrogen bonding. With our colleague from the Sierra group, we know now by atomistic uh, modeling uh, why this is and what are the differences between the hydrogen bonding of the different polymers to the, the drug we have here. Now, this is <coughs> sorry, step growth polymerization, which limits us very much if we go to block copolymers. And of course, uh, limits us when we talk about the 
a degree of polymerization and others. So we went on to a chain to chain growth polymerization. So what we did is <coughs> we took natural L amino acids as starting materials and made um, these two five morpholine dione monomers where we have all the crystal structures of that. Using an organo catalyst and using an alcohol initiators, we can do now a ring opening polymerization. And up to about 60% that really works in a very nice manner. So we can tailor our molar masses with very low dispersities. And these polymers are very well defined. So we know the end groups from multi investigations, from electrospray investigations, and so on. Now we have a toolbox. We know how to initiate by an alcohol these new monomers. And now we need the hydrophilic block. And we don't use PEC. We use the monomer, which is very frequently used in my group. We use the polyoxesomates. And we use the ring opening polymerization in the microwave um, of, a, of this five membered amino ether to produce the polyoxazolines, where we typically have methyl or ethyl, a side chain. So they show water solubility and they show the stealth effect. The pro for us is here we can introduce starting groups could be uh, for example um, a peptide a sugar unit outside of our system at the end and we have an omega n group and if we do the chemistry the correct way we end up with hydroxy groups to do so what we do is we do the ring opening polymerization we don't terminate directly with water we put an ester n group which we can cleave selectively and we have to 99 percent then the hydroxy n group we have a, a water soluble polyethyl oxazoline hydroxy macro initiator, which is very well defined and we can make different lengths again in a library approach. And now using the conditions we, we selected and improved before using our cyclic morpholines, we can do now the block copolymerization and we have now the hydrophilic hydrophobic block copolymer where we can vary both blocks in a systematic manner and we have the degradable one with the hydrogen bonding and we have the stealth polymer on the other side. We learned that in the bulk they really mix they are very effective hydrogen bonds between both polymers so if we mix them in, in the solid we see by atomistic um, simulation that they have very effective hydrogen bondings in between these two blocks. If we now go into water solution of course, the, the water soluble part will dissolve, will dissolve in the water. We produce micelles, we produce nanoparticles, and if we vary further, we can go to vessels. So now this is again a toolbox with the help of modeling. We can select the right uh, for a certain truck, the right polymers. We have the hydrophilic. Um, shell polymer, we have the hydrophobic degradable one. So this is an area where we place uh, the typical phobic core material, which is based on polyesters. So this is an ongoing effort. We got funding for another uh, three years in this uh, period to explore this now together with our colleagues from medicine, from pharmacy, and see how far we can go with these new kind of hydrophobic degradable polymers besides tuning the crystallinity of the uh, other polymer types of the typical polyesters. Of course, this work is only possible because of funding of the German Research Foundation and other parts. These are the students which are involved currently and were involved and the supervisors. And of course, we don't do this alone. We do this together with our cooperation partners. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, dear Professor Schubert, first of all, thank you very much for being more than precisely in time. Um, therefore, um, I think we, let me just check if we have questions available. And probably we can ask one or two straight away. No, Matthias, I couldn't find any. Uh, me neither, okay. But then maybe I can add a little question, Matthias. Yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Uh, <laughs> if I have the opportunity also of co-chairing with you this session. Uh, and Professor Schubert, I was just curious about the degradability of these esters with these amides. Uh, do, do you have any any um, yeah, experience about if they alter uh, compared to the classical polyesters, uh, since you also have now the, the additional hydro, hydrogen bonding groups inside these polymers? 
Uh, so they behave differently. Um, depending on the structure, you can tune the degradability. The release is uh, tunable, uh, but this is the part of the, the second funding phase of our CRC now to investigate in detail that part. And of course, um, the hydrogen bonding alters, uh, it helps in encapsulating but of course it alters the properties and therefore we have to find now this the structure property relationships and to find the sweet spots for the release there yeah and i just see that uh, sebastian accept posted a question so maybe it's not visible to everyone so i will just read it um you nicely showed the influence of copolymerization on crystallinity what about the biodegradability yeah, Seb, thank you very much. So this is the, the another parameter we are now investigating. So we know now the crystallinity, we know now the, the influence um, on, on uh, uh, TG, TM and so on. And now we investigate what does it mean for the release and for the biodegradability. Um, so this is the next parameter which we are now looking. So at the end, it's a three-dimensional plot uh, where we have two axes done and now the third axis is in progress. Perfect. Um, then maybe along these lines, a very quick question from my side. Um, when you do all the simulations, um, do you also take the solvent, which might be entrapped when you form the nanoparticle into conservation and how? Yeah, so our colleagues uh, in, in theoretical chemistry and material science, they also, of course, ask us what solvents do you use for nanoprecipitation and could that have an influence if there's a little left, uh, what would that mean? Yes, they do. And uh, what they also switch now, they go, they still do simulation, but that takes a long time because uh, they have to take several of our monomer units, of course. So they switch now to machine learning approaches um, and we switch to uh, automation of our of our experiments using high throughput um, formulation robots so and, and that we can go really for a prediction now of these systems so this is part of the phase two uh, to continue simulation but to expand it but yes um, we always uh, look what would be the influence of the acetone of this organic solvent which we used uh, for the nano precipitation perfect and thank you very much and i would hand over to lutz yeah Let's continue. Also, hello from my side. Um, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to, to share with Matthias this session and have an excellent lineup of speech, uh, speakers. And the next uh, in, in row is Robert Luxenhofer, who um, previously worked at the University of Würzburg, where I'm currently located, and uh, moved to the University of um, Helsinki. And he will today give us a talk about ultra high drug uh, nanoformulations. How are they possible and why does it matter? Robert, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Now I should be uh, visible and also hearable. Um, thanks, Lutz, for the nice introduction. Hello to my old office. Um, and yeah, I want to talk about ultra high drug loaded nanoformulations. The nice introduction by Professor Schubert right now already, I think, saves me some time because he introduced a bunch of things that I, I would otherwise have to introduce. I start with this slide showing just this journey that I'm talking about it really took like almost 15 years now. Uh, it started me doing a postdoc with Sasha Kabanov, taking with me polymers from Munich from the group of Rainer Jordan uh, that I synthesized there after my PhD. And this is just a small uh, group of the collaborators we've been working with, and I'm gonna share some of the work we've done. Also a disclaimer on potential conflict of interest, I hold variant patents and I'm a um, co-founder of Delacqua Pharmaceuticals where we intend to commercialize and get this to the clinical um, well, application. So, we already heard about hydrophobic polymers and water insoluble polymers. Um, Professor Schubert was mentioning ibuprofen. Um, here I'm uh, looking at paclitaxel, which is one of the most important cancer chemotherapeutic agents. And many other and many other actual and potential drugs are really, really poorly soluble. And they often fail in clinical application or in translation because of the low solubility. Now, very important to note that those drugs are not just hydrophobic, but they're actually polar hydrophobic. As we can see in paclitaxel and most other drugs, there are a lot of polar moieties, and this is important um, for their solubilization. Now, how to, how to address the problem of solubility? Medicinal chemistry, of course, changes the drug structure. We can attach these to polymer prodrugs uh, or make polymer prodrugs by drug conjugation, but certainly the most simple way how to deal with that appears to be drug formulation. 
and as we just seen in the in the previous talk, polymer micelles or polymer nanoparticles are well known and often used for solubilization. But there is a big but in my opinion. Um, the drug loading is really typically limited, often to 20%, 25%, much often much less. We just heard in the last talk 1% of ibuprofen. And even if the drug loading is relatively high, the overall solubilization is often very limited. So how much can you get actually into solution? Um, so basically, this is affected by the colloidal stability. And we, we developed this, this project um, over many years, and we, we have a platform developed that consistently for many, many drugs can achieve more than 58% drug loading and a really a massive increase in solubility in, in water or aqueous media of 100,000 or more. Now, when we look at polymer micelles or polymer nanoparticles, we often have a very simplistic picture in mind. And you see that throughout all the literature over many years. And it doesn't really change much, or it didn't change much. I hope it will. So we have drug molecules. We have amphiphilic block copolymers. And we somehow make this nanoparticle. And inside of the nanoparticle in the hydrophobic block, there is the drug somehow uh, located. So the hydrophilic corona is there to solubilize and stabilize the particle. It should provide stealth. We heard about that. It kind of defines the protein corona. And the typical go-to is just use PEG, or of course, you can also supplement it with your favorite stealth polymers, as we just heard before, polyethyloxazoline is one of them. Um, then the hydrophobic core is just there to give stability. Low CMC is important there. It carries and protects the drug. And here, it's really just use PCL, PLGA, or make it more hydrophobic. We just seen a nice, interesting alternative to that. But basically, it's it's really, I think, we still have a too simplistic picture of this. OK, so we need to shatter this. And I hope I can uh, convince you that um, how we need to address that. So this is our toolbox. Uh, Professor Schubert already introduced polyoxazolines. We also work with polyoxazines. They have one methylene group more. And here, just to show you, there's a wide variety of side chains. We can vary hydrophilicity, hydrophobicity. So ethyloxazoline, Professor Schubert already introduced. And methyl and ethyloxazoline are somehow often discussed that they are similar to polyethylene glycol. Now, the standard approach often in literature is just to make the hydrophobic block more hydrophobic, while we actually make it as hydrophobic or only as hydrophobic as necessary, basically just barely hydrophobic. And I want to show you some reasons why we do that. So looking at the hydrophobic domain, um, we are now comparing butyloxazoline, which is barely hydrophobic, and nonaloxazoline, which is very hydrophobic. Butyloxazoline, in fact, the homopolymer, it doesn't dissolve in water, but it is hygroscopic, so it sucks up water. And this is because of the amide groups here in the backbone. Now, when we use tri-block copolymers with butyl and nonyl, and we try to solubilize paclitaxel, we can see that nonaloxazoline basically does what it typically, what most polymers can do, about 25, 28% of a solubilization, but butyloxazoline actually can reach up to 50 weight percent of paclitaxel. And this is only paclitaxel, but we did you know, dozens of different drugs. And this is true for many, many drugs. And it's in all cases, butyloxazoline is a better solubilizer than nonaloxazoline. We have not found one case where this is not true. So the barely hydrophobic hydrophobic block does much better than the very hydrophobic hydrophobic block. But more interestingly, the last couple of years, we went to look into the hydrophilic domain, just as also Professor Schubert um, um, pointed out. So there is this, this viewpoint from Martina Stenzel that showed some interesting effects of the interaction of drug and the hydrophilic domain. So here, the, 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 the point here is not so much what is the stealth property doing, but how does the drug interact with the hydrophilic polymer? And we've seen that when we looked at our micelles with a closer look with small angle neutron scattering is that the hydrophobic core is filled up at lower weight, at lower drug loading, the hydrophobic core is filled up predominantly, which we would expect. But if we push the drug loading further, which we can in this system, actually the shell is being filled up massively. And in the end, the shell actually carries more, in this case, curcumin volume fraction than the hydrophobic domain. Um, and we also looked at, in collaboration with Anne Christine Pöppler in Würzburg, we look at this with solid state and MR. And here also, this very clearly shows the shift and the line width shows 
that the hydrophilic domain is very strongly involved in the drug binding. So it's clear from these analytical tools that there is a significant involvement of the hydrophilic corona and drug solubilization uh, in this system. And Heather, my PhD student who's just about to defend, then asked, okay, but then what happens if we change and we move from methyloxazolin, which we normally use, to ethyloxazolin, which we already saw in the previous talk. It is still extremely water soluble. It is a stealth polymer, but it is slightly more hydrophobic than methyloxazolin. Now, again, we make triblock copolymers. We vortify a little bit the hydrophobic domain also just to get a better picture of it. And again, PEG here is somewhere in between. Now, if we just look at the drug solubilization of paclitaxel and crocomine for these different hydrophobic blocks, with all of them have a hydrophilic methyloxazoline corona, we see a pattern, but in, in, for both drugs, we get more than 50 or about 50 weight percent drug loading. If we now just take out the hydrophilic domain and exchange it with ethyloxazoline, the pattern that we see for the hydrophobic blocks remains somehow visible, but the overall total drug loading drops down to 25 weight percent again. So this is like this magical number that is for most polymer micelles, 25 weight percent is somehow the limit for, for drug loading. Um, we, we've done a little bit more. I don't have the time to go in detail, but it's published work and there will be soon more work coming out. Um, but I want to show you why this is also important in vivo the high drug loading. So we did with these paclitaxel micelles and the methyloxazoline corona, we did PK studies. We did uh, this paper here has a, a lot of um, in vivo work, but I don't have the time to go through. I don't really want to go through this here. The PK is not really different for the drug loading, but the outcome for the mice with the tumor growth is different. So when we treat the mice with Taxol, none of them are cured. They all die. Um, Taxol doesn't really work in this tumor model to cure the mice, uh, not in a single injection. But if we look at the survival and the tumor growth for the two different drug loadings, mind you, the drug is the same as here. The, and the drug loading, here, or the, the amount of drug we inject is the same between two, these two groups, but the drug loading is different. We can see clearly there's a, quite a significant difference how long it takes for the tumors to come back and also the overall survival of the mice. So um, there's more to that that will be published soon, but I, I can't talk about that yet, or actually it's not out of my work. Um, but I just want to show you also that these ultra high drug loaded mice cells are really performing well, also compared to Abraxane. So Taxol is the old Paclitaxel formulation um, that has a lot of issues. Abraxane is a new one. It's a, it's a billion dollar product or a multi-billion dollar product. And we clearly outperform Abraxane also with our formulation because we can safely inject more with these ultra high drug loaded mice cells. This is a very, let's say, boring tumor model. It's an A2780 coming xenograph. But this is more interesting. I think the LCC6 MDR is a multi-drug resistant orthotopic model that normally does not respond to conventional chemotherapy with paclitaxel. But if we give this, if we are able to give a high enough dose, we actually can prolong survival. Mind you, this is a multi-drug resistant tumor and Abraxane doesn't do anything here for survival. Um, the higher drug loading or the high drug loading in these mice cells also helps with brain delivery. So this is, we saw an increase of the concentration of this drug BT44 in uh, 13 fold. This is uh, still to be submitted for peer review, but it's a preprint if you wanna have a look and if you wanna critically um, discuss it, I'm happy for feedback. And then finally, also going to polysarcosine, we heard about this in one of the last, sec and I think we will hear about more in this section. We recently published with uh, colleagues at um, AstraZeneca, this polysarcosine lysine telodendrimer. So where we basically hear our drugs attached, that makes it to an amphiphilic system. And then we can also solubilize the drug fulvestrant in the micelle in addition. So it's like a drug conjugate plus a drug formulation. And here, uh, Jessica could achieve 77 weight percent drug loading, but, but even more impressive, I think, is the increase in solubility from 9.5 nanograms per liter of full westrand up to 57 grams per liter. So this is an increase of solubility in almost 10 to the power of nine. Um, sorry, wrong direction. So this, what I think the simplistic picture we had, I already discussed that, I think we need to change that. Uh, and it's, it's really important, I think, um, and we missed it out for, for many years. So the hydrophilic corona, at least in our system, I'm not sure this is true more broadly, interacts with the cargo. 
Um, and to just make the hydrophobic block more hydrophobic, also, I don't think this is the best strategy. Um, I think the polar hydrophobicity of our polymer micelles, and in a way I saw that also, I think maybe in, in Professor Schubert's presentation is, is really critical. So in summary, we and, and others identified profound drug interactions with the hydrophilic corona. Um, I think this is probably one of the most overlooked but critical phenomena in drug delivery system because this interaction will affect how the stealth polymers do their stealthing. Um, that also, I think this is very important in protein drug conjugates and polymer drug conjugates, um, lipid nanoparticles, liposomes. And for instance, here, there is a, a computational study by Alex Bunker here in Helsinki, who compared pegylated liposomes and poxylated liposomes. And what does the difference with the targeting moiety? So also what happens with the targeting? Does the targeting moiety, so some of the targeting moieties are quite hydrophobic. Let's look at, for instance, in particular, um, uh, sorry, I'm running late. Um, in particular, um, some of the yeah drug loading, uh, drug targeting are really, really hydrophobic. Anyways, with that, I come to my, the end. Uh, I thank my students, collaborators, and um, thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot, Robert. You also stayed perfectly in time. So this is excellent also for maybe um, getting a few questions into the round, uh, which we then also later on will continue in the debate in the Zoom debate room. But um, are there any questions? I'm just looking in the, the chat. Matthias, did you observe already a few? Maybe if, if then I'll just take the opportunity and ask one um, with respect to um, the contribution of the hydrophilic shell. I was wondering, Robert, um, does it that at a certain point still and also counteract with the hydrophilic shell still being necessary for the solubility and for the, let's say, also the, the stability in a more biological complex environment? That's Absolutely. Yes, um, so we saw that when we take, for instance, the dry powder uh, at different drug loadings, we saw very, very different sol the solution rates. So that would be important for powders that you use for oral uh, digestion. But definitely, I think, uh, so Martina Stenzel had some evidence already that the endocytosis changes with the drug loading. And that's exactly, I think, what we need to study much more. I think the protein corona, I think endocyte, everything I think will be, somehow affected. Of course, it depends on your particular system. If you have a, a nanoparticle or a micelle, depending on how you do define this, all this will matter. But I think even in a nanoparticle with a glassy um, core, whatever the shell is, it will affect, it will interact with the drug most likely to different things and, and to different extent. And I think this is something we barely looked at at all. Okay. Perfect. I also have a quick question, Robert. Um, how can you, as I asked you, I'm quite sure I asked this questions a while ago. And uh, so I try to do it again. Maybe I finally hear and learn something. Um, how can you outperform Abraxan with a micellar formulation, which is as unstable as Abraxan? How is that possible? <laughs> well, first of all, we can uh, we can inject more because we can inject more safely. Abraxan, you 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 we but always why? think well, we always think that Abraxan is just serum albumin, but it's not native serum albumin. It has under it has been processed. It has been most likely changed in the ternary structure and uh, so on and so forth. So you know that's the first thing. Second, we can inject more. We can inject it safely. We have clearly a maximum tolerated dose that is much higher. But there is another story to this, which I cannot talk about yet. Uh, it's not out of my lab. Um, so, but you, I think the paper will be out in the next couple of weeks and that will answer all your questions. Okay, hopefully, right. hopefully not, well, no, you always have questions. But... I get back to you in Valencia, if I, okay. if I may. Okay. Sure. Then thank you very much. And uh, Lutz, let me talk over because now it's my pleasure to introduce Lutz Noon so that he doesn't have to introduce himself. It's my pleasure to do that. So we were both working uh, in Mainz in the SFB 1066, and then I left for Leiden, and now he left for Würzburg. 
So Lutz, it's really a great pleasure to introduce you and I'm looking forward to your talk. Please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Matthias. And uh, thanks again also for Beat uh, to allow us to, to um, have this uh, session on, um, on, on macromolecular aspects that can improve drug delivery on certain levels. And also for me to have here an opportunity to speak. I hope everyone can see my slides and also hear me. Great. So then I'll continue and I would like to shift a bit the gears and would also um, uh, um, talk a bit something that we are also doing in the Collaborative Research Center in Mainz uh, and uh, in, with collaborators also in Belgium with respect to um, drug delivery to the immune system and opportunities that are out there um, with respect to especially macrophage um, targeting. And macrophages in particular play a, an important role in certain disease progressions. We have heard a lot also in the talks yesterday about macrophages playing an important role in the microenvironment of cancer and not allowing uh, a lot of uh, checkpoint inhibitors to become active, but also in other diseases they support with their rather anti-inflammatory phenotype, um, the, the disease progression, which has also been observed, for instance, in liver fibrosis. However, these uh, immune cells still being present in these uh, environments can, um, can change their phenotype upon a certain stimulus, uh, which we would like to deliver to these cells. So, and repolarize in their phenotype into a pro-inflammatory one that can also become anti-tumoral anti or also anti-fibrotic. And uh, yeah, immunologists usually classify them in, or in old views with, with this M1, M2 phenotype. And um, um, still both uh, phenotypes have uh, one in common and that's their phagocytotic behavior, which we have also observed already very early during my postdoctoral research with Bruno de Geest when it comes to uptake uh, in vitro already, there is a difference between nano-sized material um, and uh, um, the same polymer, the double hydrophilic polymer that um, is soluble as a, a single um, entity. We see that when it is cross-linked into a, a nanogel, a much better recognition and phagocytosis by macrophages in vitro. And this holds also true in vivo, not only that we have um, a better uh, biodistribution or accumulation of nano-sized material when it comes to accumulation in lymph nodes, but when we look then also um, uh, what kind of immune cells are involved uh, in, in the lymph node, then on, on the first spot, of course, we see dendritic cells and many other antigen presenting cells being a very prominent and also for vaccination purposes, what we are all currently exploring then also with the LNPs. But on the other side, let's say what comes second in row are then the macrophages, which are ideal to be addressed and um, stimulated with immune modulation and then also help to assist in further immune therapies that are targeted. Um, but when it comes now to the size regime uh, and how to uh, synthesize such materials, I think blockopolymer, oh, uh, macromolecular chemistry in particular, also the blockopolymer chemistry in the self-assembly approach is quite straightforward. With the controlled polymerization techniques that are out now, we can then in combination with a self-assembly get all these nice uh, nano-sized structure, also vary their morphology and end up with materials in the 10 to 100 nanometer size regime that are ideal for such purposes. But here, please bear in mind that also that this is a um, self-assembly approach in, in equilibrium. And once we expose them to a complex biological environment, it is very complicated to really predict what's going on then there with these structures. And then also disassembly or aggregation of these materials can occur. To circumvent this, there are a couple of strategies also out that also have been, for instance, reviewed here by Matthias with respect to core cross-linking of uh, blockopolymer micelles, and then upon um, degradation of these cross-links uh, upon a certain stimuli, we will have a better control over the self-assembled structures in biological environment. We've addressed this need with an um, um, alternative approach, which we call the uh, nanogel approach via reactive precursor polymers, and which is summarized here that we use amphiphilic blockopolymers with a reactive block that is self assembled that can self assemble and provide then the reactive block inside the core, where we then can do further chemistry with respect to covalent attachment of drugs, then cross linking. And at the, second, at the third step, then hydrophilizing the remaining entities inside the core, because then we have a fully hydrophilic um, um, 
nanoparticle where the crosslinks inside the core can degrade and then unfold into single polymer chains that are then easier excreted or released from the body. And to do now chemistry inside the cores of these materials, we explore that the reactive ester chemistry with all these um, reactive amine reactive entities is straightforward for this approach. And over the years, we have collected uh, quite some experience with uh, these pentafluorophenyl phenyl esters to do chemistry inside the core, because also there we can do the self-assembly in organic solvents because of the fluorophilic effect of these uh, blocks. However, when it comes now to um, addressing macrophages, we were particularly interested in the repolarization of these um, um, cells or immune cells with drugs that are already approved and already out on the market, which would help us to proceed with all the safety um, um, yeah, knowledge that we have about the drugs to then simply shift the biodistribution of these drugs and the pharmacokinetics and deliver them more into the macrophages. And one of these drugs are bisphosphonates, um, which have been shown in retro to really undergo this repolarization on macrophages. However, bisphosphonates, as we all know, they are approved rather for treatment of osteoporosis because they have a high affinity to the bone. And so there is an urgent need now to really translate these drugs uh, towards uh, macrophage repolarization with nanocarriers. And luckily, there's even also a um, bisphosphonate out with a primary amine called alandronate, However, there's one disadvantage of this um, bisphosphonate and that it's, it's exclusive solubility in water, which says, which doesn't allow us then to do all this nice uh, reactive ester chemistry because as soon as we have um, too much water there being present, then also these esters hydrolyze and we cannot really go straight forward with this synthetic approach that we are doing here. So we had to come up with an alternative amine reactive entity that allows us to do selective conjugation of bisphosphonates in water. And luckily we um, found uh, these squaric ester amides that have been introduced by Lutz Tietze in the uh, 1990s um, for um, conjugation of primary means with respect to peptide or protein modifications with uh, carbohydrates. And um, we then designed a monomer with a scuric ester amide side chain that can be polymerized under controlled radical polymerization conditions. So we applied, for instance, the rough polymerization, um, um, obtained these nice blockopolymers, removed the end group, and then checked for the self-assembly of these blockopolymers. And in water, we got these uh, beautiful, nice micelles. But when we then gradually added an axis of a primary amine that helped to solubilize the core, then we could immediately get this um, um, unfolding or a degradation of these micelles. However, if we first added a cross-linker to these um, micelles, let's say about 10 to 20, 30 um, uh, um, equivalents or percent equivalents of the reactive entities and afterwards removed all of the reactive entities, we then obtained these beautiful um, narrowly dispersed um, cross-linked nanogels. So we call them then also gel because also the core is hydrophilic and with respect to our previous uh, nanogels we have introduced, now we call them squarogels because of the squaric ester chemistry we're using here. Um, that these particles were really also cross-linked could also be proven when we dried the material and then looked via electron or atomic force microscopy and could really observe these small single entities and not that we would get any films that you would usually get from self-assembled structures. So they were covalently cross-linked. And of course, with respect to the degradability, you see we, are, we were using these ketone cross-links that we have also previously used for our pentafluorophenyl ester derived nanogels. And there we could nicely observe upon acidification at pH 5, which is usually present in endosomes, how these materials then gradually unfold into single polymer chains. Um, <clears throat> the covalent conjugation of um, primary mean functionalized fluorescent dyes allowed us now also to uh, trace and monitor these particles. So one technique is the fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, where we can also then follow this material in, under certain un environmental conditions by simply looking at the diffusion behavior of your fluorescent species. And here we could again confirm the degradability at, at pH 5 
but it allows us also to monitor the presence of this material in very more complex materials, for instance, in blood plasma. And there we observed a, a high stability of this material up to uh, 24 hours, so we couldn't find any difference in the diffusing behavior of this material. Um, we could also label this material then also with a near-infrared fluorescent dye that allowed us now also to monitor the biodistribution of these nanogels after intravenous injection. And here we saw that uh, these na nanogels then also distributed all over the body and remained in the circulation of the bloodstream. And this allowed us now also to um, take samples from these mice over time and then do a sam um, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy on the um, blood samples we were taken. We made use then of an um, advanced technique that has been developed by Kaloy and Koinov, which allows us to um, filter off the, the, the blood cells from this very small drop of blood and then do inside the pores of such filters fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. And this allowed us now to monitor the degradation behavior of our ketal cross-linked nanogels in the bloodstream of the mice. And here we observed that again, after 24 hours, our nanogels were still present, still intact as we could observe previously with uh, the incubation in blood serum. However, after 72 hours, when we then took a sample, we saw a gradual degradation. And this could also be confirmed when we measured this under the standard conditions with plasma or even with PBS at 37 degrees, we see this is a physiological condition where then also the ketones start to slightly degrade over time. Just as a side note, at four degrees, this was not the case, which gives us also nice opportunities for storing the material over longer time at cold temperature. Now coming to the alandronate, which we could then now also conjugate to this material as well without any problem. Uh, here you see again how these materials remained cross-linked, um, provided excellent pH degradability uh, related to the um, ketal, and still were also stable in the blood plasma over time um, determined by FCS. Um, the conjugation of the um, bisphosphonate, of course, then yielded in a negative zeta potential because of the negative charges of the phosphonate. And um, with respect to the drug loading here with a covalent approach of conjugating the bisphosphonate, we could also get rather high drug loading of up to 35 weight percent determined by the spectrophotometric phosphonate assay. Um, then we checked for the repolarization behavior on um, M2 polarized bone marrow derived macrophages and saw with respect to the M2 phenotype that uh, these ma um, macrophages were providing that these uh, markers, certain markers could get reduced after incubation with our alandronate um, loaded nanoparticles. And on the other hand, M1 um, typical gene, um, genes were uh, stimulated and were even better stimulated compared to the alandronate alone. Uh, we then checked also how it, uh, how it works for the biodistribution. Now we have heavily attached this negatively charged drug to these particles. Here's again the comparison, the um, nanogel without the drug, but with the pegylation circulated quite long in the bloodstream. We also compared just the free drug, which was excreted after one day from these mice. However, with our alandronate being attached to the nanogel, now we saw um, uh, circulation, but also probably because of the negative charge and accumulation in the liver. We then teamed up with uh, Detlef Chupan in Mainz, who's working on liver fibrosis, and he observed that macrophages have a particular important role in the disease progression of macrophages, of um, liver fibrosis, in particular M2 macrophages. And um, so um, he observed that the, the, yeah, the scar tissue that is formed um, instead of the functional liver tissues and also heavily equipped with um, CD206 positive M2 macrophages. After treatment uh, with our nanogels, uh, three treatments in a, in a row in one week, we observed that then M2 macrophage markers were reduced uh, in, the, in the tissues of these uh, livers while um, the, macro, the number of macrophages was not altered, which gave us a further hint that um, repolarization um, was happening. And this could also be uh, confirmed by gene set enrichment analysis. So by these NGS analysis, we observed that um, inflammatory genes were um, enriched after treatment 
and they also showed that show that we had a higher polarization of M1 versus M2 macrophages. This also then helped later on in this therapeutic model to reduce the collagen load and the, the, the formation of the scar tissue and the progression of fibrosis. As we could see here in the whole liver, liver the amount of hydroxyproline, one of the markers for collagen was significantly reduced. And the same holds, holds true for the amount of collagen that was deposited in the tissues that we found with the treatment. So not only repolarization helped, but also the uh, preventing the decreased progression could be uh, now here treated with the macrophage targeting. Um, at the moment, we are now also looking at cancers in the liver, how we can treat the cancers in the uh, yeah, being present or being present also metastasis that are accumulating in livers with our nanogels that can alter the macrophage behavior in the liver. But alternatively, of course, we are not only interested in um, macrophages that are present in the liver, but also in distal tumors. And uh, with that, maybe at the very end, I can just give you a little outlook that we are also working on targeting these um, uh, macrophages via an active approach. Alternatively, we would still rely on the EPR effect and the passive accumulation of our nanogels in the tumor. But additionally, we would also foster the delivery with um, um, nanobodies that are targeting the CD206 receptor on these macrophages. And we could already attach a TOLAC receptor agonist to these, macro, to these um, nanobodies and prove that uh, these nanobodies were accumulating there and uh, reduce the growth of the tumor um, and also in comparison to an alternative nanobody that um, was not targeting the macrophages there. And at the very end, uh, to keep this short now, we were also able now to covalently conjugate these nanobodies on the surface of these uh, nanoparticles I've introduced to you before, and then observe that we also have a preferential uptake of now our nanogels with these uh, nanobodies being um, exposed on the surface. So we have now a couple of tools for addressing these macrophages and also a couple of drugs to repolarize these macrophages. And with that, I'm at the end of my talk and would like to thank especially my highly enthusiastic team that supports me, in particular Anne Huppertsberg, who worked on this squaric ester nanogel approach and is today handing in her thesis on this. So all the best also from my side to her, as well as also to all the collaboration partners that helped us at the University Hospital in Mainz, but also in, in Belgium, and especially also the Collaborative Research Center 1066 that is supporting this um, project. And um, yeah, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. So much is you mute. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Lutz. Uh, always the same issue after several years no online. Still, um, so I don't see uh, questions here in the chat, neither on the web page. So I might be really a technical problem. Um, but I, I, are there any questions from the audience right now? Then maybe if I may. Sure. Yeah. Just real quick, I guess I missed it, but so the alentronate doesn't have to come off the polymer to actually do its job. Is yes. that correct? Okay. Yeah, so the bisphosphonates, there are a bunch of different bisphosphonates, uh, also with other functional groups that are attached there, usually to alter the, um, yeah, the, the pharmacokinetics with respect to osteoporosis treatment. And by chance, this uh, amine structure allowed us now also to do covalent conjugation, because usually there are some clues that you have an oxidation process that then releases um, um, uh, bisphosphonate from the from the side chain where you usually have this variation in modification and we could not really prove this is very difficult to to prove but um, in how this works inside cells um, how do you have then the metabolic um, yeah, release of, of these um, um, yeah it is it is uh, something like a pyrophosphonate a pyrophosphate analogon that then has actually the effect inside the cell and is um, differently treated uh, and, and altering the um, ATP, ADP, AMP um, levels inside the cells. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, then any other question? Then I do have maybe a more philosophical one. Yes, but I, I think we could also address that here. Do you think that repolarization of macrophages is sufficient for tumor immune therapy? 
No, not at all. I think you also saw this in the last tumor cur curves that I showed where we were also only treating um, uh, or addressing repolarization. We saw then an alteration in the, in the uh, tumor growth, but we really have to see um, that combination, uh, also immunologic, Im immunotherapy combination is probably rather beneficial in this case. So we really have to see what is the immune status of the of the tumor. Yesterday we heard about uh, in the immune score of, uh, of a tumor is probably the first to decide in which direction we start the treatment, vaccination, checkpoint inhibition, and maybe also, and then modulation of the microenvironment, and then um, probably combining this all in a certain row or in a certain way is something where we then with our nanotechnological tools can help to assist with respect to checkpoint inhibition, um, vaccination, or then also um, microenvironment modulation. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Maybe then it's my time now to to move on, and it's uh, it's my great pleasure that we can welcome now uh, Rachel O'Reilly to give um, her speech. Now here, Rachel O'Reilly is a professor, um, chemistry professor, and a chem a professor of polymer chemistry at the University of Birmingham. And, uh, and she will give today a talk about precision polymer nanoparticles. Thanks a lot that you could make it to this session and uh, the screen is now yours. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And thank you for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about our work. Um, I've really enjoyed the talk so far. My talk's going to be a little bit different. I'm going to focus a little bit more on self-assembly and actually try and present one um, uh, bit of work that we um, published a couple of years ago, but I think it shows um, from our perspective and um, potentially the power of self-assembly and um, when considering how we might design um, uh, carriers and um, for nanomedicine. So just to flag, I mean, my, my research group is very much interested in self-assembly and we have two different um, real areas of self-assembly that we focus on. The first is crystallization driven self-assembly um, where we've actually, as um, we heard from um, Uli earlier, how you can use the crystallization of um, polyesters and, uh, to, uh, to uh, and there can be a challenge when you look at uptake, we're actually really interested in how we can use that crystallization to drive um, assembly to form anisotropic structures. But today I want to talk a little bit, uh, focus on the, the concept of polymerization due to self-assembly. And this is a self-assembly method that we've um, uh, used extensively over the last couple of years because it provides um, a really useful tool, I think, both for encapsulation, but also for tailoring um, both the hydro hydrophobicity and membrane properties um, of constructs. And that's what I'd like to focus on um, today. So for those, I'm sure everyone's familiar with polymerization, just self-assembly, but just a very quick um, concept. Um, you start with a soluble um, macro initiator, um, uh, and then you polymerize a miscible monomer. As that monomer uh, polymerizes and you start to form the second block, you, it undergoes self-assembly um, during polymerization, um, and then you can form based on the, as, you, as, as um, in all self-assembly processes, based on the, the hydrophilic hydrophobic um, packing parameter and ratio, you can form a, a range of different constructs. And PISA is particularly interesting because actually you can work your way through this phase diagram and access um, uh, and map out the phase diagram and then be able to access a range of different morphologies. So it's really very, very simple and um, it can be done in water. I'll show you how we've been able to do it. You can do it um, at room temperatures under very mild conditions. Also really quite high weight loadings of constructs. So we're not no longer making block of polymers, purifying the block of polymers, then assembling, purifying the assembly and then uploading. The idea is it really is to be able to do it in a single step and um, which makes it much more and um, uh, much more potentially scalable and we can really access um, higher order morphologies very readily but one of the challenges in polymerization due to self-assembly um, was that um, the choice of this water miscible monomer um, is actually quite um, is quite important because we start with this in this case this is for a reversible addition fragmentation system if we start with a hydrophilic macro CTA and then start to polymerize this water miscible monomer um, this monomer um, as it grows should convert from hydrophilic to hydrophobic and this was these were the range of monomers when we started looking at PISA a number of years ago these are the range of monomers that have been reported in the literature and it very much seemed that there was no right almost no rhyme or reason or no knowledge uh, uh, no insight into how would you predict potentially that a monomer might undergo PISA rather than just trial and error and see if you'd formed an assembly um, during the polymerization. 
So this HPMA monomer was the primary monomer that um, we, we, we were using in a number of our studies were um, uh, being, uh, we uh, were using this monomer, but this monomer actually comes as a ratio of isomers. And we were seeing, depending on the, the stock of HPMA that we were, were purchasing, we were seeing um, quite different um, phase um, behavior sometimes. So we um, collaborated with Rob Mathers at Penn State University in the US to look at, and he's very much pioneered this very simple concept um, of a log P over surface area um, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a definer for a polymer to be able to rationalize its, 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 its hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity. But crucially in PISA, we're looking at this and modeling this as the oligomer grows. So we can see if the polymer becomes more hydrophobic as, um, as, the, as the chain grows or more hydrophilic. And this allows us to then be able to um, uh, decide whether the monomer would be good as a core forming or as our corona forming block. Um, and we were able to see that we were, these are, these, we did first scope this out for a range of known um, uh, PISA monomers. And then we proposed some new monomers. And these were um, uh, monomers that we um, just design, drew, designed, and um, hoped we'd be, we'd be able to make. And we focused um, on some of the isomers of HPMA to try and see if we could understand a little bit about the design of the monomer that we might need for PISA. So doing this, we, we um, proposed these new monomers for PISA. Um, uh, some of them, we were able to make them. Some of them were solid, so we weren't able to readily incorporate them into our PISA system. But what we were able to show was that based on the hydrophobicity, um, based on our log P over surface area as our parameter, we could plot the log P over surface area um, against the DP at which we got the onset of assembly. So the, 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 the degree of polymerization in which our um, uh, growing polymer chain became hydrophobic enough to induce the assembly. And this means, and these all worked well, our, 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 our new design monomers worked well, and uh, they mapped well onto the known monomers, which allowed us now to have the handle to be able to predict when uh, an assembly would undergo, sorry, when a PISA system would undergo assembly. So we started to be able to get the, the lower point of our um, uh, phase diagram. And this was an important tool to allow us to be able to um, uh, uh, design um, further different um, core forming blocks. And it was, uh, the, the nature of that core forming block is important if we want think of course about encapsulation or any kind of um, other chemistries. But one of the things that um, we were particularly interested in was a lot of really nice early work um, uh, was done around using thermal initiation. There was um, uh, now a number of years ago, uh, a lovely paper here um, from someone in Tang Lazang, where they showed um, you could use aqueous photo PISA. So this is just using purple light in our really mild conditions to be able to form these assemblies again at high, high solid contents, but really very mild. And we wanted to see if we could use this for encapsulation. And so the concept being, if we imagine we take a commercially available, say, PEG, for example, functionalize with our, with our macro initiator, we purify that, and then we can self-assemble in the presence of whatever we want to encapsulate and then purify. And there's two nice examples here, which were, again, a number of years old, which from both the arms group and, again, from the same um, for the PISA group, using both silicon nanoparticles and BSA. Um, but we were actually interested in thinking about how we might be able to use the membrane properties to allow for size selective permeation. So the idea being if we take a, a PEG macro CTA, take some sort of functional protein, in this case, the example we'll talk about today primarily is therapeutic, we could imagine by having um, encapsulating and embedding our um, uh, therapeutic within the lumen of our um, polymerosome, um, the, the, uh, the, given the nature of the membrane, the small molecular reactants should be able to permeate, um, however large antibodies and proteases would be um, excluded from the uh, the enzyme and allow for protection. So the idea using the mild polymerization conditions coupled with the size selectivity or permeability of our membrane, we might be able to allow for improved um, stability um, and action of a therapeutic enzyme. And we can see, um, just to show, this is just the example with horse riding peroxidase, but actually encapsulation, do, doing the PISA process in the presence of, a, of, a, of an enzyme, as well as in the absence of an enzyme, really leads to really very similar size particles. We see the same membrane thickness, membrane properties, etc. So it, it really, it, the, the PISA process can, can be, uh, happens in exactly the same way in, this, in the presence, which is important. And the therapeutic that we were interested in was asparaginase or AS. NS, um, and this is an um, uh, injectable treatment for um, acute um, lymphatic leukemia. Um, it, it functions by depleting asparagine and then prevents um, tumor growth. Um, so, so this is mode of action and this is the, the, the drug. There is a, 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 a 
number of side effects, which can be prevented by pegylation. And this is Onkospa is the, the trade name for the, the pegylated. Um, however, the, there's problems with hypersensitivity and actually um, both drugs have um, incompatibility issues, as you might imagine. So the idea was we would take our um, uh, asparaginase um, and uh, uh, perform our PISA, just using our standard HPMA system with a PEG as our corona under our um, PUDA PISA conditions um, and um, encapsulate within, the, within our polymerosome, um, with the idea being that, as I said, if we have um, our uh, ASNS um, within our polymerosome, um, we should be able to actually um, uh, reduce the ex extracellular concentration of asparagine and the idea that um, cancer cells um, can't, uh, um, uh, can't make their own asparagine. So by virtue of um, uh, depleting the, this our ASNS should have a large effect compared to a healthy cell where, which can um, produce its own, its own um, asparagine. And this was the, 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 the proposed mode of action. So we were able to take our uh, macro CTA and our monomer and do the, the PISA. We formed um, polymer zones here. You can see about 340 nanometers. And with the idea being that the mode of action requires the, the, the small molecule um, uh, permeation and then action within uh, the lumen um, of our, uh, of our uh, depiction cycle here. However, uh, the protease is an antibodies too large to be able to permeate. So this size selective permeation would protect um, but allow for still uh, the, uh, to go the mode of action. So if we look at the, 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 uh, the properties of this uh, um, AS and S loaded polymerism, we can see if we do the um, anti-NS binding, we can see just with native, as we'd expect to see strong binding, the PEG, you see some reduction in binding, but really with our loaded vesicles, as we might expect, we see a significant uh, decrease. So we've been able to protect the AS and S as we, as we would expect. If we then look at the activity, um, um, and this is now, um, we look at it in the presence of um, um, alpha-capitrypsin, um, if we have the, the loaded um, vesicles, we can see um, uh, with and without the camitrypsin, we see um, no, no detrimental effect of the alpha-camitrypsin. However, with the three, three ASNS, as we may expect, we see a, com we see a complete loss of performance activity. Um, again, the pegylation really doesn't provide much um, protection from um, proteases. Um, and again, this, this second plot here, um, uh, where we show here in more detail for the asparaginase loaded vesicles, this is act, after incubation for seven days. So we're really seeing um, effective um, protection and, um, uh, and maintenance of a high level of activity. Um, so we're able to increase the stability and reduce antibody um, recognition compared to either the free or the pegylated um, structure. So um, if we wanted to then try and mimic the depletion of asparaginase in the surrounding environments we did in, in, in vivo assay, where we took our uh, growth medium, which we incubated with our uh, ASNS um, uh, loaded vesicles, um, and then uh, took this um, uh, centrifuge drop and then took the supernatant growth media, which was depleted um, in asparaginase, um, and then treated um, with gene silenced um, cells that were not able to produce um, asparaging, um, and compared with normal um, growth, cell media for seven days. And we can see that for the, the um, our two controls, we, we saw uh, proliferation degree. We can see for our asparaginase um, uh, loaded vesicles, we see a 50% drop in cell proliferation, indicating that again, the, 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 the polymerosome is indeed infected, being able to um, prevent proliferation in uh, the, the gene silent cells, which are very promising. So um, just to conclude, Include. Um, uh, I think PISA is potentially a very interesting approach to allow for the loading of maybe perhaps quite sensitive therapeutics. And perhaps we can start, we're, start, we're interested in starting to think about how we might be able to use this inherent size selective membrane to allow for protection, but also still allow for transport across the membrane to allow for modes of action. I should just thank Team PISA, and um, most of who have now graduated. Yuji is now an academic in Shanghai, Spiron, Spiros is now at Sheffield, and Jeff is in the US. Of course, Matt Gibson, who I worked with on this from Warwick, and Rob Mathers from UPenn, and then the rest of my research group, and of course, these people funding, and I'd have to answer questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this brilliant talk, Rachel. Um, 
and of these great opportunities one can do with um, PISA already in C2 encapsulation. I see that uh, Jan van Hest has a question. Please go ahead. Maybe you can talk it here in this um, session already. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Rachel. Um, a great talk. Uh, so, I had a question. Have you also looked into the in vivo fate of your chromosomes? So, do you do you know what the biodistribution is of these uh, particles, or are you looking so, into this? We haven't looked at. We haven't looked into it. Actually, I think we we reached a point where it became apparent that actually the design of these chromosomes they weren't really stable enough. So, we've now started to try and work at how we can make them a little bit more stable. So, we haven't yet. I, been able to yeah. Do. yeah it, it's a concept we're we're hoping to do more with but haven't really taken it yeah further. yeah thanks all right i think uh in in view of time matthias i think we, we should yeah. proceed and then continue with the questions and debate afterwards matthias please yeah then yeah thank you very much and now it's my great honor to introduce uh, an esteemed dutch colleague professor jan van hess from Eindhoven in university um, will actually tell us something about how to engineer artificial antigen presenting cells with topological control. I'm very excited already by the title. So um, please continue, uh, start with your talk. And I hope I learned something here about a new area. Yes, Thank uh, thanks, Matthias. Can you hear me well? Perfect. Okay, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be part of this uh, great uh, symposium and I'd like to present some of our recent research in the field of polymosomes that we have created to, to make them into artificial antigen presenting cells with a focus on controlling that topology. Um, so, um, of course, as we all know, I think immunotherapy is one of the most promising methods that we have available to, to combat cancer. And in fact, nanomedicine can be, play a very important role in this entire field of immunotherapy. And I think uh, Lutz already explained very nicely that we, for example, you can use uh, nanoparticles for immunomodulation, kind of turning the kind of uh, the non-responsive tumor environment into an immunoresponsive one, uh, for example, by turning the, the repolarizing the, the macrophages from, from a non to a responsive uh, field and also to uh, kind of uh, recruit the myeloid cells. Another possibility that you have with, uh, with immunotherapy is that you can create nanovaccines, so particles that carry uh, kind of uh, respective uh, uh, fragments of the tumor that can be uh, kind of um, displayed to the immune system are taken up by dendritic cells and in the lymph nodes and spleen they can create uh, cytotoxic uh, T cells that then also can attack the tumor. That's a promising approach but also has some short uh, some uh, drawbacks uh, quite often the response is uh, short-lived and one way to circumvent this uh, this problem or one of the problems is that we're not gonna kind of use a vaccine to activate dendritic cells that then activate the T cells, but try to activate the T cells directly. And this is then the field of artificial antigen presenting cell research. In fact, this is already done in the clinic where in fact uh, the patients uh, T cells that are naive, so they're not activated yet, are kind of isolated and then exposed to Dyna beads. So these are micro micro-sized beads that carry the right signals to activate the T-cells and then the T-cells are proliferated until you have sufficient of those and then they're placed back into the patient. This works uh, but has also significant limitations. It not always works out very well and especially it's a very fragile and also costly method that therefore really hampers the, 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 the large-scale application of this methodology. In effect, it would be more easy not to use micron-sized beads that in fact can only be used for ex vivo interaction or activation, but to use nano-sized particles that can, in the body of the patient itself, directly interact with the T cells and activate those. And that's in fact the area of creating these nanoparticles for artificial for AAPCs. Uh, in order to be able to create an effective response in T cells, you need, in fact, two or even better, three different types of signals. The first one is the, 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 the kind of the tumor specific signal that's based on the MHD complex that carries a fragment, a peptide that is uh, uh, kind of characteristic for the tumor that you want to uh, attack and kind of displays it, exposes this to the T cell, and then there's a specific interaction with the T cell receptor. It's one part that's the specificity, but in order to get a real good response, you also need a co-stimulatory interaction 
between uh, one particle, uh, one, uh, one group on the dendritic cell and the receptor on the T cell. And furthermore, to control the type of activation you get, uh, cytokines are very important. That can determine whether you get a kind of uh, cytotoxic uh, T cells, killer cells, or whether you get more regulatory T cells that can help in the production of antibodies and also in a memory effect, so that, uh, that the kind of the immunization against the tumor also has a lasting effect. Of course, this idea about placing these different cycling uh, molecules on, on particles is, is not new. Many people have looked into the field, and you can see there's a plethora of different particles that have been applied in this uh, field of research. And I think it's also kind of a problem with this field because you have so many different particles, we have so many different scaffolds and chemical features, whether they are carbon nanotubes or liposomes or, or kind of even surfaces, that makes the comparison between the different systems very difficult. And in fact, what we wanted to do in our research is to see if we could get some more systematic evaluation, which aspects are really important to activate effectively T cells. And for that, we wanted to investigate in a systematic study, the effect of topology on T cell activation. And in our research, we want to kind of, carry, uh, kind of tackle three different criteria in that sense. So there's three different aspects. First of all, it's the aspect of size. So we want to have bigger particles and smaller ones. There's the aspect of shape, where we want to have spherical and tubular-like ones. And that's the aspect of kind of ligand density, whether we have either high cell density, high ligand density, or low ligand density. And in fact, also a fourth additional component is that yeah, I already mentioned the two signals that you need. Uh, you can either display them on the same particle, uh, the same particle, or two different particles. It also wants to see that effect. And the readout we're using is, in fact, uh, based on, on these uh, three different uh, kind of uh, biological assays. We want to see the, the occurrence of uh, these um, early uh, activation markers or kind of a later stage activation marker. We want to see look into cytokine production to see T cell activation. And also we want to look at T cell proliferation as a, as a manner, as a method to see if this system works fine. But the basis, of course, in order to make all these topologies possible and also to really kind of take away the, the scaffold itself as a determining factor in the T-cell response is that we also want to make these particles all from the same kind of batch, the same, I would say, mother particle. And in fact, we're able to do so by using a, a polymosome-based approach. So the basic material that we're using is this PEG PD, PDLA system, which you can easily make by this uh, opening polymerization. And in order to make polymerizant out of this, we dissolve this block of polymer in an organic solvent out of THF and the And then to this, water is added. And we normally add about 50 volume percent of water to create well-defined uh, spherical vesicles. But of course, under these conditions, these vesicles contain organic solvents, not only outside, but also inside. And in fact, this is an extra opportunity to control the specific features of these polymerizants. Because if you now start dialyzing away the organic solvent, it's not only removed from outside the vesicles, but also inside. And since there's 50 percent volume percent of organic solvent, quite a lot, and that can that can leave the particles pretty easily because the membrane, of course, is hydrophobic, it's a PDLA, and it has to be replaced in order to keep the same volume by water. And that process is slowed down. So you first release the organic uh, kind of the organic solvent molecules from the particle before water can go back in. And that leads to a volume depletion. And the volume depletion then also leads to kind of a shape change because you have, in fact, too much surface area for your particle, so it cannot adopt a spherical shape anymore. So it starts to change its shape. And the, uh, the shape change you can see is, in fact, two ways. One way is when you have a kind of a, an original curvature that is positive or neutral, then you go via the prolate shape change and you make soups. And if you have a slightly negative curvature membrane, then you go into first discs, and these discs then turn into these so called nano cavity controlled uh, nano cavity containing particles of schematicized ball shaped structures uh, that's in fact the oblate pathway but for this uh, line of research we're going to focus specifically on the prolate and in fact we can really control uh, the, the amount of shape change we get by by changing the dial dialysis medium the more electrolyte we add to this dialysis medium the more effective the shape change happens so if we have no salt in fact dialysis leads still spherical vesicles. If you add a little bit of salt, you see some particles start to deform, but quite often the most of them more or less keep a rather spherical shape. But going to 10, even 50 millimoles of sodium chloride, you see a very high aspect ratio of these tubes that are formed out of these uh, spherical polymer cells. 
Well, besides shape control, of course, we also want to control over the size. And for that, we can use an extrusion method. If we have still organic solvent present in the medium, then the membrane is plasticized enough to push it through an extrusion membrane. And of course, based on the size of the pores, we can resize the original polymosomes into different, differently sized uh, vesicles. So we can make large spheres, we can make small spheres, and of course, using dialysis, we can make large and small tubes. And the nice thing is that all these different uh, topologies are all based on the same polymosome. So chemically, all these structures are fully identical. They only have different shapes uh, because of the processing we did afterwards. Then, of course, we need to introduce the signals. And the signals we introduce are signal one, signal two. In our case, we have chosen for these two antibodies. So the first antibody is anti-CD3, which is a kind of a generic activation system. So it's not as selective as the MHC1 complex you normally use, but this one activates all T cells in a, in a non-selective way, so it's not tumor specific. And the second signal, the co-stimulatory signal, is the anti-CD28 that specifically activates with the, the co-stimulatory T cell receptors on, on the T cell uh, on the surface. And in order to incorporate these two antibodies, we label them with a cyclic octine. And then you can perform the strain promoted uh, alkyne azide click reaction with azides on the polymerzone surface to immobilize these two antibodies on the surface. And by controlling the different um, kind of ratios between antibodies and polymerzones, we have control over how many antibodies end up at our polymerzone surface. And that allows us to make this entire library of different components. In fact, we've made 60 different ones, but I've only shown here the most important ones, where we can control the size, either make small or large particles. We can create topology, tubes, and spheres, and we can have either high density uh, ligand display of both ligands uh, on the same particle, or intermediate or low density display. And we also have made particles in high density that only contain either the anti-CD3 or the anti-CD8, uh, CD28 components. Um, so now, of course, it's important to find out what is the effect of having these different topologies and, and densities on, on the cell activation. And before I go into this, just to explain a little bit what we mean with high, intermediate, and low density, it's a little bit based on how much space every antibody has on the surface of a polymerase. And with our methods, we have fluorescent labeling, we can nicely de uh, determine how many uh, antibodies are there per polymerase, and then we can find out how much space they occupy. And you see that with high density, we are more or less in the regime between 20 and 10 nanometers per, de per antibody. The, high, the low density is between 60 and 40, and the intermediate, of course, is somewhere in between. We also try, by the way, choose a ratio between the CD3 and the CD28. It's about one to two, because that's also known from literature that that's kind of a good feature for effective uh, activation. So the first thing we investigated is the effect of co-display. So we looked at uh, either here in the large scale, uh, large precise particles, spherical particles, whether we have both signals on the same particle or on two different particles. And in fact, we always keep the antibody concentration the same. So they're just only differently displayed to the T cells. And then we see a striking difference. So the free antibodies, and also the mono kind of system, they really don't activate well, looking at uh, interleukin uh, tooth uh, production. But you can see a clear uh, kind of activation when you use them uh, on the same part. And in fact, this is kind of similar for all different topologies. Uh, we see this also not only for uh, early, but also late stage activation. The only difference which we see observe is that for the smaller particles, so the spherical small particles, there the effect is not as pronounced. And we think that's the reason because these smaller particles, multiple of them of the different uh, kind of uh, monovalencies can cluster together on the surface of the T cell and still then kind of display in a kind of in a, com um, in a, in a combined fashion, both the antibodies to, to the T cell surface. But the bi bigger particles, you need really the bivalent uh, kind of uh, exposure. Then if you look at uh, what's the effect of size and shape, and for that we looked into all the different uh, features. I only have highlighted two of them, so the early uh, activation markers and also the silicon production. And indeed, what we observe is that the larger particles are more effective in activating T cells than the smaller ones, especially the large spheres at the highest density of, of ligands has the highest activation. But what is really interesting is that if you look at intermediate densities and affected tubes, are more effective. The tubes have a better way of activating the T cells at the intermediate density than, for example, the spheres have. Um, but it's also interesting that if you look at, uh, for example, a uh, longer term response, we can also recognize the same, uh, the same results, especially at intermediate density, we see a more pronounced effect of the large tubes compared to the other systems. 
where the difference is really not significant anymore. And we also still see also at density and intermediate density still an effect that larger particles are more effective than the smaller ones. So you see that large spheres are better than the small spheres and the higher the large tubes are better than the small tubes. So this indicates that in fact, if you want to get a much, uh, the most optimal system, you need to control, of course, the density of the ligands. You need to control the size of the particles, but it turns out to be that for these experiments, also shape plays a role. Um, so in, in, as a conclusion, we can say that in the uh, co-display, for sure, it's very important for effective detail activation, and that is something also we not only found, but that's also known for literature. It also turns to be out to be in our experiments that elongated particles have a better chance of covering a larger surface of the T cell and therefore give a better activation at at least lower densities. If you have a higher density of ligands, then that effect is more or less overruled. And in general, large particles are better than smaller ones. Of course, I have to mention these are all in vitro experiments on cell level. Of course, if you go to in vivo applications, then of course, uh, the size, the shape of the particle will also have an effect on, for example, biodistribution. And then you have to find out in which kind of uh, um, immune organs the, the, the particles end up. And of course, that could also have an effect on which particle you would choose for a certain application. So this brings me to the end. And I uh, would uh, like to thank with, uh, with and, uh, and for thanking these people, especially I'd like to thank uh, Annelies and Yai for the great work on this topic. Also, I'd like to thank my colleagues from uh, Precision Medicine and Immunoengineering in Eindhoven and colleagues from uh, Tumor Immunology in, at Harbaut uh, UNC. I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Great talk. And I'm quite sure there will be some questions already here in the chat. Now let me check the page. And in the meantime, let me ask a question because <laughs> I have actually a couple, so we probably have to meet on later on. Um, but the first obvious thing, and you talk about a lot about the density of your yeah. of your uh, surface modification, and isn't that dynamic? Um, well, the PDLA membrane is is uh, pretty robust and and kind of rigid, I would say. So it's, I mean, we have also other polymer systems based on say paper lactone trimethylene carbonate, which are more flexible and dynamic. The PDLA system is not as dynamic. Therefore it can also maintain its shape. So we can change the shape of the particle and it doesn't go back to the original shape. For example, if you want to do the same mm. shape change tricks with liposomes, um, you can also get these transient structures. You can make all kinds of beautiful, differently shaped liposomes, but it's all transient. You cannot stop that process unless you cross link the membrane. They all go back in the end to a spherical system, which is the thermodynamically favored system. Uh, if we take away the plasticizing agents, so the organic solvents, then the structure we end up with is frozen in. That means that the membrane has a level of rigidity or robustness that prevents the reshaping to occur. So I think also therefore, as a result, I think the dynamics is uh, less. Of course, you could argue that for an effective T cell response, dynamics could be a positive thing because it allows the, uh, the antibodies to reorganize themselves to get the most effective immune synapse uh, for the activation of the T cell. Okay, then the follow up one. So since we have Lorenzo, anyhow, as a collaboration partner, did you check how is the distribution of, so let's say, how much does the surface density differs between your particles? Yeah, so what we've done is we, we have kept, in fact, the surface density per particle the same. So we try to really make sure that we, uh, we take different topologies and we have one level of density. Of course, it's, uh, these are still different experiments, so it's always within the same, with a certain uh, error margin. Uh, but we want to keep sure that the density is 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 within a certain regime, so high, intermediate, or low density. Yeah, but we, between your particles in one group, the density will also differ because you cannot basically yeah. control where your attachment takes place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, we're talking about uh, multiple particles, huh? so you have you'll talk about thousands of particles that you have per experiment. So I think in that case, the, the statistics, yeah, at a certain moment will rule out. Of course, if you want to go to that extreme that you have exactly one type of, of ligand per particle, that's an option, but you also have to take into account that although we size, resize the particles, they still also show a, a distribution. So there is always some kind of uh, dynamics or, uh, or kind of window of operation that you can achieve. But what is in fact with all these particles the case is that they all start from the same polymer, polymer zone batch yeah. and therefore chemically 
they have the same scaffolding features. I was just thinking when you have Lorenzo already there as yeah. a collaboration partner, maybe you can really try to use super resolution microscopy yeah. to get a yeah. better understanding and maybe yeah. back up your oh, we, we did, by the way. So we used Storm and you can see that you have co-display of the different uh, ligands on the surface of the particle. The, the resolution, because these are they, they are pretty small for, for Storm, so you, you can get some resolution. We're still working on improving that, by the way. So you can see go display, but in fact, to, to answer your question, if you to really quantify that, we need to go a step further in, in analysis. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. I, I think we, we should move on, Matthias. I looked a bit yeah. on the time and we are already one talk uh, behind, despite the, 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 the great uh, first uh, opening talks we had where we always kept in time. So let's move on and uh, give the, the screen to Sebastien Le Commandou. Um, full professor um, and director of the Laboratory of Organic Polymer Chemistry at the CNRS at the University of Bordeaux. We are very happy that he is with us here, um, despite being very early in, in Canada. Um, so we are very, ha very happy that you're still awake, and I hope your research will also keep us more and more awake. So the screen's yours, yeah. Thank you very much, Lucy, and I would like to thank you and Bart for, for, the, for the kind invitation. It's, uh, I think it's a great symposium so far. Um, can, can you see my screen well and hear Amy? Yeah? Everything's fine, yes. Okay, wonderful. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about uh, the subtitle is mostly what I will focus on, and I will try to, to highlight a very specific part on how we can engineer nanoparticle surface to somehow control and eventually modulate interaction with, uh, with cell receptors. So, uh, what, what we liked in my group is to design a block copolymers uh, with specific uh, size and shape and architecture uh, bearing different functional groups so that we can control both uh, self assembly and somehow uh, bioactivity in, in the different systems. And so, we, we try to indeed uh, build polymer with uh, some kind of bio inspiration um, in order to bring functionality to the, to the polymer uh, nano, nanostructure by itself. So, somehow, a, a goal of a, of a of a quite large research line in my, in my lab is to try to design block of polymer that can code not only for safe assembly, but also for bioactivity. And of course, if you, if you think about that, you need to use polymers with, with, which can have specific bi biological activities. And this is really what I want to focus on today, how we can incorporate polymer uh, with specific biological activity into a, into a block structure to bring functionality in one step into the, uh, to the nanoparticles. So this, uh, this work started uh, quite some years ago, almost 10 years ago, when we wanted to design somehow virus-like nanoparticles that can recognize specific cells and, and, and consequently improve therapeutic effects. And the kind of structure that we wanted to mimic in a very, very simplified manner were these famous glycoproteins that are very important, especially on the surface of viruses. So the chemistry we, we use initially is very simple. Again, combination of two blocks together, adophobic polybenzy glutamate here, that we conjugated to amidophilic uh, polysaccharide, or oligosaccharide, which can be many different kinds of oligosaccharide, and I will focus uh, today only on, on hyaluronic acid base. So, of course, we use uh, the click chemistry uh, coupling, this uh, gain to couple these two polymers together, that works beautifully in DMSO, which is a, you know, very good carbon solvent for many, many kind of polymers. And we could end up with this particular amphiphilic double block polymer structure. Here, the, the helical conformation of the polypeptide was very important to control the way the system could self-assemble and, and, and can form in different conditions, solvent and also composition, adophilic to adophobic balance, uh, small shears, disc structure, or vesicle-like structure. As you can see here, we have a very nice population of vesicle, and we focus on that. Uh, and the surface here now is fully covered with the uh, hydrophilic oligosaccharide. And this can have some, of course, consequences, how the system will behave in, in vitro and vivo. Um, of course, we have vesicle, and, and as highlighted by uh, uh, um, uh, Rachel or, or, or Jan earlier, uh, this polymeric vesicle have an interesting carrier, um, not only because of the, of the, of the shape, but, but uh, because of the ability to uh, encapsulate eventually different kind of drugs. Uh, adophilic, adophilic or adophobic. And here in this initial work, we demonstrated that we could encapsulate docetaxel, doxorubicin, drugs that are more or less polar. Uh, here, mostly in the adrophobic membrane, here, mostly at the interface or in the, in the adrophilic uh, reservoir. And we can, of course, potentially encapsulate the two drugs together. 
this system, HAPPLG, uh, were demonstrated to be very safe. Uh, you see here the safe variability um, over 72 hours, uh, up to 700 micrograms per milliliter without uh, you know, any, side to, any, any side effect or any toxic effect. The system were very stable, colloidally speaking, here because the membrane is very, um, very cohesive and very interactive. Um, and because we have sugars at the surface, here the system can be easily uh, lyophilized and redispersed even without any cryoprotectant, which makes the system very interesting for, for potential um, pharmac pharmacological transfer. So what we can do with that? I mean, of course, we, like any kind of nanocarrier, we uh, wanted first to demonstrate that we can increase the pharmacokinetic profiles or modulate the pharmacokinetic profiles. We increase the half-life in blood of the of different drugs. We demonstrated that we can reduce the toxicity of the drug when it's loaded compared to the, to the free one. And here, uh, we quite some time ago, we demonstrated that we can indeed induce uh, tumor regression. Uh, here, this is a tumor grow without doing anything. This is the treatment here with the doxorubicin on the breast cancer model uh, that is free drug in red and in blue. This is the, the tumor regression profile with the same amount of drug that has been encapsulated into the pulmonary fascicles. And here you see the survival curve that demonstrates that it's even of course, more efficient, but much less toxic because here we have no mortality of animal on the time scale of the experiment. So this was initial time point, I would say, initial uh, contribution in this, in this field. We, 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 we patent and transfer this, uh, this, uh, this uh, technology to, uh, to a company here named Adosia. But we wanted to go a bit further and understand why we have so interesting results, I would say here, um, and potentially, the, the, the reason why we have uh, this, uh, this um, interesting uh, ability to, uh, to treat uh, breast cancer is because on breast cancer, you have uh, uh, receptors that are CD44 overexpressed in the signs that can be selectively targeted by uh, uh, hyaluronic acid. There are some other uh, model, cancer models that can uh, have the same ability, especially lung cancer. We, we more recently work uh, on collaboration with a group in Global. Uh, we, we have uh, different cell lines on lung cancer, uh, expressing no receptor, no CD44 receptor, we're expressing here uh, a lot amount of these receptors. And as you can see on this curve here, you see that the nanoparticles, you have a concentration dependence increase of interization into the, the cell that express a receptor, and you have almost no interization on the cell that will not express a receptor. We could demonstrate that indeed, even on 2D and 3D culture, as you can see here on spheroids, that we have, um, uh, we label the, basically the, the CD44 receptor with a, with a green uh, antibody. We label the particles here in, in red, and you see that you have co-localization of the receptor and the nanoparticles. Demonstrate again that we have internalization onto these cell lines because of the interaction with, them, with the CD44 receptor. This experiment, competition experiment, was, uh, I think, even more um, important. So we normalize here you know, the three different cell lines, the, 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 the fluorescent level, and we pre-incubate the cells with a free HA that's supposed to block the receptor. And what you can see here is that on cells that would not express receptor, you have almost no effect, and cell on cells that do express receptor, you have a, a very important uh, decrease of interization. So again, more receptor expressed and more nanoparticles are internalized in a selective manner. Uh, of course, when you think about it, it's quite surprising because it's known that HA interacts with CD44 receptors, but with very high molar masses. And in the present situation, we have at the surface of all nanoparticles, hyaluronic acid with low molar masses, basically five kilodactyl. And if you look by SPR, by immobilizing CD44, and if you flow the uh, HA of different molar masses, as uh, demonstrated by Dan Pierre earlier, you see that uh, if you increase the molar mass, you increase the binding ability of, uh, of your of your HA basically towards the, the CD44 receptor. So again, all other particles are made with this low fragment that binds very poorly. And here, if you rinse your chip, basically you see a strong disruption. And now, if you uh, inject into the SPR system on nanoparticles, to see that they over overpass basically uh, even the one million kilodalton HA uh, HA system. So you have much stronger affinity somehow towards the receptor. That can be understood as a multivalent effect because you have multiple presentation of HA at the interface of the nanoparticles. Um, so this multivalency is very important. And we wanted to go a bit further and somehow understand and, and see how we can modulate these particular interactions. 
So to do so, we made mixed nanoparticles. And so we, 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 we synthesized first HAPBLG, and we synthesized laminarin uh, PBLG with exactly the same molar mass of PBLG, same block, and we have oligomers here, which are about uh, equivalent. Laminarin now is an oligosaccharide that, is, that doesn't bind SD44, but that is a ligand for dectin 1. That is another lig uh, uh, interest, interesting ligand to target, especially involved in, 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 uh, in immunity. And so we made mixed nanoparticles by co-assembly using uh, nanoprecipitation, uh, microfluidic nanoprecipitation. And so we have particles with 100% curvature of hyaluronic acid, and we, got, we can go down uh, to 70% of 50% curvature. And what you can see is that if you look now at the interaction with HA, you see that you can modulate and tune basically this spinning interaction by modifying the surface density of HA at the interface of the nanoparticles. This is quite nice, but we can even go a bit further because now we have particles that eventually present two kinds of, uh, of ligands at the interface. And so we wanted to demonstrate the ability of these nanoparticles to bind two, two receptors together. Again, we use um, uh, SPR to do so. And so we first immobilize here CD44. We inject the nanoparticles presenting here mixed laminarin and uh, hyaluronic acid at the interface. We're supposed to have an inter interactions here due to the HA CD44, as you can see here on the binding. If you, we rinse the chip, you see that we have more disruption, so still it's very strong binding. Um, and now if we uh, inject dectin-1 uh, free in the, in, the, in, in the SPR chip, we're supposed to have uh, the interaction between dectin-1 and the nanoparticle each surface presenting laminarin. And this is exactly what we observe. And again, this uh, interaction is quite stable because here after rinsing, we see that we have no disruptions. Of course, you can think or consider that this interaction here can be non-specific. And so to demonstrate that it was really specific interaction, what we did is that we inject, in the first uh, level of injection here, we inject 100% nanoparticles with 100%, sorry, HL interface, nanoparticles with 100% laminarin at the interface, after rinsing, we're supposed to have only nanoparticles with AHA. And of course, if we inject now here, uh, dectin-1, we're supposed to have no interactions. And this is exactly what you observe. So th this, this work basically demonstrates that we can uh, use these co-assembly approaches with two different bonding blocks in order to build nanoparticles that can have the ability to bind two different receptors, uh, 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 two different uh, cellular receptors, basically. But it was even more surprising uh, when we uh, look at the um, system and uh, especially interaction with, um, uh, with yaronidase, which is you know, supposed to degrade yaronic acid. This is something that we, we did um, in collaboration with L'Oreal. It's uh, obvious that uh, yaronic acid is very important and yaronidase that degrades yaronic acid is very important in this, uh, in this kind of application, cosmetic application. So the experiment that we did is that Again, we demonstrate that if you take first HA 1 million kilodalton, you have a very strong affinity towards uh, CD44, as you can see by SPR. Now, if you add into your system year in the days, the enzyme will degrade uh, the HA, and the high molar mass HA will become very small fragments. And as a consequence, you see the binding ability of this, uh, of this solution now becomes very low because now we have, you have very small fragment of H into the system. You can, you can follow this degradation also by losing other vis viscosity, because of course the one million kilodalton H is very viscous. And if you degrade uh, your H in small fragment again, you, you will of course decrease significantly the viscosity. And now what happens if we add into the solution um, nanoparticles of HAPBLG? You see that uh, you will somehow recover the ability to bind and the viscosity of your system by adding a very small amount of your nanoparticles. And the, the reason is that because the reason is that is, is that now a nanoparticle can bind and interact with yaronidase and block basically the activity of these enzymes. And so we did um, more, um, let's say, uh, detailed experiments and, and especially concentration dependence uh, inhibition effect, and we, we could determine an IC50 of the system, which is about 115 microgram per milliliter. And this is basically three orders of magnitude better than, than uh, standard inhibitors for uh, yearly days. 
Of course, this can have also very important consequences, not only for cosmetic application, but also on cancer. Because of course, in, in, in many cancers, you have an overexpression of yarinidase in the near environment of the tumors to cleave and, and degrade uh, yarinic acid to, ex, to um, uh, improve the expansion of, of, of tumor cells. And this is especially very important for, for lung cancer, basically. So the take-home message I wanted to, um, uh, to give you today is, uh, is that nanoparticles can, can be more than uh, you know, a reservoir uh, that can load drugs and eventually multiple drugs, as can be the case for, um, uh, for polymosomes, but can really improve also its, its bioavailability. And here, when using um, adrophilic polymer that can be a ligand, you can really use the multivalent effect that you have at the surface of the particles, you can really enhance the affinity of the ligand um, with, a, with a low binding ability, which is the case for HA, a low molecular weight. This is a very poor ligand, but now at the surface of the nanoparticles, it becomes a very important, the nanoparticles itself becomes a very important ligand, I would say. Of course, the core assembly. Uh, can provide nanoparticles with the uh, ability to bind different receptors. And we can call here these mosaic nanoparticles. And this is very close to what, uh, to what Jan has been demonstrating earlier. Um, you can really tune and, 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 and modulate the binding and interactions with different receptors, different ligands, different receptors. And, and eventually, you can even transform a low affinity ligand by making nanoparticles to an efficient inhibitor. So making nanoparticles is not only, you know, making nanoparticles, make something different and the object is really something different. And again, I think the system are very simple and in this field, I think the, the, the simpler the better. And especially if you think about clinical translation and this approach again is quite, quite simple. So I'd like to uh, end up and, and thank all the people involved in this work. I'd like to thank all my group and I would be uh, very happy to answer any, any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great talk and this uh, nice overview of the opportunities with uh, also with these um, click um, chemistry derived block of polymers in the self assembly and also the later on the intrinsic function of these polymers. Are there any questions um, also here in the in the group in the zoom group because I have checked already. Um, from the from the audience, uh, there have not yet any questions arrived. Maybe I just have a little question on the on the mode of action. You showed that the um, the degradation was purely related to the high molecular mass um, uh, um, hyaluronic hyaluronic acid that was inhibited by your short hyaluronic acid exposed to the to the to the or, or on the surface. Um, how is it then also with the the smaller hyaluronic acid? Is it also being um, degraded as well or inhibited um, uh, by the um, interaction with the hyaluronidase? No, it's it's a very good point, and to be honest, we don't have uh, the the complete answer. Uh, we we suspect somehow that uh, the the low fragment of HA somehow enter the pocket of the enzyme and and somehow block or inhibit its, uh, its, uh, mm -hmm. its activity without uh, allowing a proper degradation. But this is something that we have to demonstrate and probably, uh, you know, molecular docking experiment would help in, the, in that yeah. sense. But we, we have not been doing this kind of experiment. But this, this would be, it was very interesting to go, to go further in that direction. Yeah, probably then also to, to there have opportunities to um, vary the mobility um, and vary it when you have it on the surface exposed versus a soluble version, maybe this already has an um, impact on it. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. yeah. Okay, maybe um, uh, to not um, yeah, take away too much of the time then also of the break, but still have also opportunity to discuss later on the, um, in, the, in the debate room. Matthias, it's now your um, great challenge to wrap up everything and speed up also <laughs> with your, uh, despite your huge um, scientific contributions, but still to keep it short and still leave us some time afterwards. Um, so Matthias and um, me have been working in mind for quite some time in the group of Rudolf Zentl. And uh, then when I was at MPIP, Matthias was developing his independent group and uh, is now uh, professor at the University of Leiden and he already shares the screen so please go ahead Matthias yeah and unmute your microphone please <laughs> uh, 
Ah, perfect. Sorry. Yeah, same issue. Okay, then thank you very much, Lutz. Um, yeah, I will try to present you an overview about uh, what we are doing actually in relation to immune therapies and also try to wrap up a little bit and relate to the talks we have heard in our session today. Um, because I think really material aspects will have an impact on nanomedicine or the translation of nanomedicine towards the next generation of drugs in the clinics. And therefore we should really emphasize the role of chemists and in particular polymer chemists in this area. Um, for maybe some of you are not aware, uh, already two years, I'm a professor at Leiden. Um, I'm still partially affiliated to MINDS uh, to continue our work in this uh, collaborative research center. Um, yeah, basically in the beginning, just briefly a conflict of interest statement. Um, yeah, I either work, receive funding or act as a scientific advisor for the companies disclosed here. I don't see any conflict in this presentation. However, you have been informed. Um, yeah, maybe by, by now everybody knows that uh, my group is basically only working with polypeptoids with the own brackets, which have been defined as a combination of polypeptoids, in particular polysarcosine, with the well known polypeptides that presented in the talk before. Um, so we have introduced this term in 2014, so not a while, not so long ago. Um, and I think this material is quite interesting because you can really combine the functionality of polypeptides as we have seen before in terms of yeah, functionality, in terms of degradability, compatibility, stimulant responsiveness, and maybe most important secondary structure formation, which you can also guide, use to guide second, uh, the formation of distinct particle morphologies. And um, also this is known for a long, long time. The polypeptoids have just been, I think, yeah, I don't know, I don't want to say introduced, but heavily promoted by Robert Luxenhofer, who did uh, an outstanding work in this area. Um, we only focus on polysarcosine um, because I think this is one of the most exciting materials. And therefore I will take uh, some seconds to, to introduce this material again. As an amino acid, it's an endogenous amino acid it occurs in our um, lysine metabolism, uh, glycine metabolism, and in general in tissues with high energy demand. As a polymer, um, it's hydrophilic, it's not ionic, and a weak hydrogen bond acceptor. And it really has stealth-like properties like PEC because it, it has basically the same physical chemical properties. So whenever you, you, you want to have a substitute for PEC, but maintain the properties of the material, at least in aqueous solution, I think this is a very nice material to go for. And putting these systems together, you can really design functional blocker polymers being completely based on endogenous amino acids. And yeah, I don't want to overemphasize that too much. There will be a vast debate on uh, the pros and cons and PEC and polysarcosine. And uh, also for polysarcosine, we have to see what are um, the clinical factors, what are tox profiles and so on. If we can really improve um, drugs by substituting PEC with polysarcosine. However, um, the beauty really is uh, there are first indications that uh, polysarcosine based lipids are better tolerated or have better immunological profile compared to the pegylated counterparts in mRNA formulations. Um, we don't understand the mechanism. I'm also not so sure if we ever will, but there's first evidence. And for companies, which is I think a very important factor is the patent landscape in the area of polysarcosine is uh, almost completely empty compared to PEC. Uh, moreover, and there's something I already said, but I would really like to emphasize that the, sol the solution properties in terms of main chain flexibility, uh, interaction with water and so on are really identical between the, the um, accuracy of the measurements between PAC and polysarcosine. Moreover, um, PTS, the company founded by Maria Vicent, uh, is also currently able to provide these polymers in GMP grade and basically help companies being interested in this kinds of materials to move towards clinical translation. And also much to our surprises, they cannot only um, synthesize polymers comparable to the ones um, we have developed, but also by optimization of 
the production lines and the production setups, they can really match GPC plots. And this is something which underlines the well-controlled polymerization of polysarcosine, which really is comparable to polyethylene glycol or polyethylene oxide, whatever you may call it. Of course, there is a limitation in molecular weight or chain length, um, where we currently also don't know what impurity is causing this limitation. Um, putting that together with polypeptides, you basically have a large variety of polymer architectures which you can easily access by these controlled living polymerization techniques. But compared to anionic and even some cationic polymerizations, you are much more versatile in sidechain functionality or n group functionality, which then provides you actually a very nice toolbox to design your polymers to basically tailor nanoparticle properties to a desired need. And actually, the desired need brings me um, uh, to the topic of my presentation today. So how can we uh, basically design and apply nano uh, nanomaterials, in our case, micelles, to tumor immune therapy? Um, I think it's currently accepted that uh, not a single intervention will be the solution to cancer. So we should basically combine various modes of action. Um, maybe a strong focus and very important part is really the abolishment of immune tolerance. So therefore, I will not talk about generation of immunity or local activation of the immune system by inflammation, but I would like to focus on how we can remodulate the tumor immune system locally. And uh, we do this with basically two approaches. One is macrophage repolarization. That's what we heard from Lutz Noon before. We do that slightly different. And the second one, and that's the, also the topic I would like to start off, is the abolishment of immune suppression or CAMP mediated immune suppression. Because it's actually, I, I have the feeling, a very overlooked uh, part in, in the area of uh, immune suppression, is in particular in the melanome. And uh, it's well known, actually, largely related to the work of Tobias Bob, who's the uh, co PI of the project uh, within this. Uh, Collaborative uh, Research Center 1066 in Mainz, who basically uh, clarified the role of uh, cyclic AMP in uh, the tumor suppression. So cyclic AMP is a secondary messenger, a general secondary messenger used throughout the body, but in high concentrations, it's also used by regulatory T cells, tumor associated macrophages to basically shut down the uh, immune system locally. So even if you would basically vaccinate against tumors um, and induce activity systemically, it's very unlikely that you see local effects. And the production of cy cyclic AMP is a multi-step process. And in this process, the formation is catalyzed by the adelaic cyclase. And this enzyme can be nicely blocked by an adelaic cyclase inhibitor. In our case, we used MDL uh, 12,230A. Uh, 12, um, and since the cyclic AMP um, metabolism occurs basically in every cell, uh, blocking the formation of uh, cyclic AMP is of course something which will have severe side effects. So therefore we have to come up with a system which basically localize um, the, the blocking of the adelic cyclase. And therefore we have chosen polymeric micelles, uh, encapsulated uh, the drug here, we reached only a, a loading efficiency of around 30% by dual centrifugation. But you can see the particles are rather uh, uniform um, and narrowly distributed. And most importantly, when we inject, uh, when we basically um, bring our micelles in contact um, with various immune cells, um, we can see that the reduction of cyclic uh, AMP is measurable and compared to the free drug that we have a long-term effect. Then we went forward towards uh, the related animal model. It's a B16F10 over model. So maybe the working horse uh, in immune therapy for melanoma. And uh, we basically inoculated the tumors and then injected our micellar formulation, peritumoral, so next to the tumor, um, to avoid systemic exposure. And uh, I would like to really point out, you do not always have to go systemic. Of course, it's always the point, you need to know where your primary tumor is, but also in, in the clinics, there are very various tools to find out where your primary tumor is. So I think we should um, 
really think more about uh, also local applications of these systems. And here basically we did that. The MISL ensured that the drug remained at the tumor site. So we basically had really the, the nice feature that the large parts of the tumor were basically covered by our MISLs. So this is also one fact, which is of course well known in the field that the penetration of the tumor is quite difficult. So ideally you want the free drug to penetrate and the micell, this will be a tough one. So we general, in general, we generate a drug depot around the tumor, um, release the drug slowly from the micell, and therefore basically obtain a long lived uh, reduction of uh, local CAMP levels inside the tumor in the absence of uh, observed toxic effects. Interestingly, um, when we then basically follow tumor growth, you see for the micelles, a strong reduction in tumor growth, but only in uh, an animal model where you basically have um, the related immune cells in place. And uh, if you go one step further and combine this with a non-therapeutic uh, T-cell depletion, which is also possible in this model, you basically end up with a full regression of existing tumors. And um, of course, that's a very nice effect, but of course the non-therapeutic depletion of T-cells is something you can hardly do in, in humans, but we are currently working on either checkpoint inhibition or, and I think this is maybe much more interesting for nanoparticles, the combination of um, yeah, uh, immune activating drugs to keep that a little bit more general um, and this approach um, and hope to see basically the same effects. Interestingly, when you performed next uh, single cell uh, gene sequencing, um, we really observed that we could really find out that uh, all the observed effects are really related to an activation of macrophages, neutrophils, and T cells. So what we could hypothesize, uh, we could nicely see on the single cell data. And we basically converted a tolerogenic tumor microenvironment into a pro-inflammatory phenotype. So therefore, um, the local modulation of CMP modulation, mod, sorry, the, the local modulation of CMP mod metabolism is a really interesting way forward um, in tumor therapy. And also what I would like to highlight, it's not on the slide, but you can find that in the related paper, um, you really induce directly immunity. So when you basically challenge the same mice, which have been basically treated with this therapy, you don't get tumor regrowth. In addition, we see systemic effects against metastases. And I think this is one of the reasons why uh, this uh, quite simple approach even made it into a quite decent publication. So therefore, you can really act locally, but get systemic effects. And I think that's really the beauty of immune therapy in general. But there's something more to, to be done. And um, one other effect is, of course, a topic we are very much interested in, this macrophage repolarization. And maybe some of you are aware of that, that iron oxide is, is not an inert material. Um, there are a couple of papers here, two prominent examples who have shown that you can repolarize macrophages when they take up iron oxide. Um, to be honest, the effects on tumor growth are moderate. And you have to also say none of these systems here, ferromoxetol was really designed to deliver iron oxide to macrophages. So we thought, okay, let's try to develop a delivery system, which does not only encapsulate um, iron oxide, but also encapsulate it in a way like is shown here with disulfide bonds that um, we basically have a stable system outside the cell, but upon uptake into macrophages, disulfide bonds are cleaved and you basically really release the cargo, the iron oxide, and make sure that you have an active delivery system. As you can see here nicely, you get very nice core shell architectures, more than one of these preformed um, iron oxide nanoparticles. A nanoparticle is inside the system. Um, so you definitely have a distribution of these systems. Um, in our approach, the polymers can be made in, in gram scale. And we were even managed to make the nanoparticles in gram scale and to provide them to our collaboration partners. As expected, um, as uh, at intracellular GSA levels and macrophages, you nicely see degradation while the particle outside the cell is stable. We don't see any aggregation in, in, in serum or plasma. 
Um, but we see this nice release that the particle really fall apart, release the iron. And when we check the iron content inside the macrophages and compare that with ferromoxetol, you basically get a comparable staining. But of course, the process takes longer. So instead of six hours where we see um, already iron being um, available in macrophages, um, we have to wait somewhere between 15 and 24 hours to have the same levels of iron release from our micelles. Afterwards, we see exactly, uh, that we, much to our surprise, we see a, a strong activation of these macrophages. So it looks nicely explained, the shift from M, M2 to M1 macrophages. Um, this is basically a definition for a certain expression of surface markers like CD86, CD206, and the expression of certain R RNA markers. And in all cases, we basically outperform pharmacetol. So our effects are way stronger. So it means that there is actually a good reason to design a delivery system and not just using a commercial iron oxide nanoparticle to do the job. So we could nicely show that we really either convert M2 macrophages into M1 macrophages or uh, directly a direct M the development of macrophages into the M1 phenotype. Um, or into a more M1 phenotype. And of course, this has all been done in vitro and the question remained if this is something we can also see in vivo. And uh, so we administered these structures uh, peritoneal and uh, in mice, uh, because we were interested actually in curing lung tumors in collaboration with the University Hospital actually in Heidelberg and uh, EMBL, where there's a lot of expertise on the iron metabolism and the effects on the immune system. And we basically see the same effects, what we have seen before in cell level. Now we see that also in mice. Um, but before I basically wrap up my talk, I would like to emphasize one thing why I think iron is super interesting uh, in, tar in repolarization of macrophages, because the tolerogenic M two macrophages, they are capable of sensing iron. So you don't need to target the macrophage. The macrophage recognizes your particle and actively takes it up. And therefore you really manage, and it's also uh, presented in the publication, you really manage to be highly specific in co-culture or even animal models. And the uptake almost uh, completely occurs in these tolerogenic macrophages. And I think this is something to be considered. We are currently working on tumor therapy. I also need to say uh, what we discussed with Lutz before, a simple repolarization of macrophages will only slow down um, the tumor progression. But if you combine that with a classical chemotherapy, either micelle or liposome based, uh, you really see nice regression, at least in the lung tumor models. And we are very much looking forward uh, to move these systems um, into the next stages hopefully even clinical development. Uh, therefore, we are very happy that the technology is patented. Okay, let me wrap up. So I hope I could convince you that uh, polypeptides in general are multifunctional material, which is worthwhile exploring. And I really hope that more people join this class of polymers because it's actually not so complicated to work with them. Um, then, and of course, uh, we should really consider not only tumor immune therapy, but also thinking more about local applications of these systems, because it will make our life significantly easier. And last but not least, I think iron oxide is maybe not the ideal system for imaging, but it can become really an interesting system when you want to repolarize macrophages. You can work with drugs, but I think here you really have a nice feature because macrophages and especially tolerogenic macrophages sense iron. With that, I would like to thank my, my lab, all the collaboration partners, and of course, all of you, and especially Sepp at four or five o'clock in the morning in Canada to join my talk. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Matthias, uh, for this uh, brilliant overview of all the different um, uh, um, carriers and, and you can design with the polypeptides, polypeptoids and um, in view of time, I don't see urgent questions here already in the, in, in the chat of the, the, the speakers group as well as hardly any question 
in the um, from the audience. Nonetheless, there are still a few questions from Shiki Wang and Philip Treyer that uh, I so I encourage everyone to um, join us now in the de debate room. I think the link will be underneath um, for the people watching from the audience, while for us speakers, the link has already been posted here in the chat. And I um, yeah, I, I would like to thank again every speaker for dedicating the, um, um, th their time to, to this uh, meeting and providing insight into the research. This was really a great opportunity to um, gather all together here again and um, uh, exchange the research after such a prolonged time of not being able to, to meet and join conferences. Um, so with that, um, I would also, I, I will close the session and um, yeah, invite everyone to the debate room and uh, see you then there for the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you as well for joining our session and see you in the debate lounge.